Good morning, everybody. Pouring rain. It's a little bit lighter now. It has been a lot heavier as well. Constant, all night, little breaks. That's a big blessing. In a dry area, in a dry world, the blessing of water. Water figures so big since creation. The spirit over the waters. And so we're inside today because it would be foolish to take the camera out in the rain or I'd need better cover to defend it well. I don't think water and electronics work well together without special equipment. So we're going to enjoy this inside today. I'm not sure if anybody else had this thought when you read the, the first reading today about David being made king in Hebron with all the different circumstances before and afterwards. The thought occurred to me that of the mustard seed, you know, the whole idea of the kingdom of David, it's debated academically how big it was, how really how big it was, you know, if it was or not. It's, it's uh, also a lot of moral issues. And so the question is, you know, how much of a kingdom was it? But if you tie this in with the mustard seed parable of Jesus, then you could have a very different attitude because Jesus himself is going to be called the son of David. That's a big deal. I mean, you call the Messiah the son of David, um, it's, it's just a big deal. It means that David was important. As you call it, one of the titles of Jesus, the eternal word of God, and call him son of David, then <clears throat> that puts David on the map. David is a paradigm for defining who Jesus is. And also part of the expectation and the identity of God's people uh, hovers much around David. <laughs> In fact, something very, the other day here, there was a, a group of, of um, Israelis here, secular Israelis, and they were just over here. We can go there right now. They were standing outside the door here and they hadn't come in yet. And I'm not sure how the conversation rolled around to that point, but I, I just mentioned probably figures of the Bible and I just mentioned David. And one of the ladies kind of smiled and kind of challenged me and she said, David, sounds like a friend of yours. Are you talking about King David? <laughs> Melik David? And I said, yeah. <laughs> but you know, from a humanity point of view, like, David is, is a farming boy. He was looking after the sheep. I did too. I used to. It's interesting, you know, but the, the great awe that the people have for David, it's the Davidic kingdom. Some people still hold that politically. But obviously for us as Christians, uh, it's, it's complete paradigm is then the revelation of the eternal word of God and God's plan of salvation. And yet in this little fiefdom of Hebron, where there's still going to be a lot of opposition, a lot of ugly fighting and killing, where David shows up with his two wives and all the history behind that and and that's not the, the limit of David's family life, then you say, okay, this is God's kingdom at work. 
And then you think of the parable of the mustard seed and you say, wow, well, God has his, you know, God is, uh, is at work. And God is happy to work with the mustard seed of his kingdom with just a little bit, you know. He's happy with the little bit starting and his plan has started, the process has started and the process will continue. The process will continue. And that's the amazing thing about God's kingdom. And one of the things for us probably that's difficult is, you know, we project images of, of extraordinary greatness and glory and we want everything to be perfect, picture perfect, you know, the arch in the right place, the tree in the right place. We want everything to be right. We want the weather to be right. And we expect that also of all the life of the church, the life of society. And God is happy, actually. God is able to work with the imperfect situations. Now, obviously, we're also <laughs> called, even from Deuteronomy, to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Jesus works that line quite a bit. And that has become a great thread of spirituality in Christian history to strive for perfection. Not just perfection in how a package is nicely ribboned. You know, it's perfect gift, perfect gift packaging. But perfect perfection of our heart to strive for perfection, to be a person of love, a person of humility, a person of service, a person of truthfulness, a person of diligence and work, not lazy, you know, to be perfect in our heart. But also we know that as much as we strive for these things, we have our struggles every day. Every day we have our struggles. And some days we have bigger struggles and some years very big struggles in these issues. So God is happy to work with the mustard seed. I don't know, this gave me a, a little bit of light to catch that reality. You know, the incarnation, God is happy that it started with a little conception in a little teenage girl in a lost village at the end of the Roman Empire and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Little, little uh, mustard seeds and all the troubles that kingdom of David is going to have and David's own sins and the plagues and the problems of succession, getting Solomon to succeed, you know, kingdom and kingdoms, all our kingdoms and the big kingdom, the kingdom of God at work. I think this is marvelous. I'm going to take you inside um, to, uh, because of the gospel subject, There's a horrible accusation made against Jesus. In the opposition, Jesus, it's amazing that he endured was, was absolutely off the charts. His family declared him out of his mind. And then the one who drove out demons is accused of being Beelzebul in today's Reading, the religious leaders accuse Jesus of being the evil one. Can you imagine, like, how, how, you know, to put our mind around that accusation, to put our mind around that accusation, that, that the eternal word of God made flesh, okay, they didn't know that type of, understanding of Jesus, but this is a good person doing good, and they accuse him of being in league with Satan. 
So we're talking about something absolutely horrendous in terms of unjust, in terms of, I would call this spiritual violence. We have verbal violence, we have emotional violence, we have political violence, we have economic violence in businesses. Businesses can put other businesses out of work. They can steal their goods. They can cheat. There can be family relationship violence. People can be pitted against each other. And sometimes that type of a very bad spirit enters the heart of people. And, and Jesus endured this with such elegance, with such... Um, there's a beautiful word in, uh, in Spanish, a plomo, uh, with such... Um, such... just transcended the assault with calm and serenity, like he did the storms on the sea. And here we see a real issue that continues to this day, that some people don't know Jesus, so that he's out of his mind, this just doesn't work, this is not the way it can be, because they don't know who he is and what he's doing. And then there's the other ones who have an inkling of what he's doing, but they're resisting it. And they're resisting it passionately and intelligently. They're putting their talents to work to resist his uh, presence, to resist his action, to resist his person. And this is a reality that continues to this day. The person of Jesus still draws this type of opposition. That's very interesting because Napoleon doesn't, and Alexander the Great doesn't, and as much as we dislike Stalin and people who have done great evils in the world, you know, we don't resist their persons anymore because they're not players. They don't play in the game. <laughs> they're out of the game. Maybe it's a little bit different with philosophers uh, because their thought might continue to prevail and we could, you know, engage with that. But the effect of... of um, the resistance to Jesus is a very interesting phenomenon. It's really a sign that he's alive in the world. And this is something uh, people have to deal with today. <laughs> and you remember when Simeon said, and he is destined to be a sign of contradiction. And a sword will pierce your own soul too, that the secret thoughts of many will be revealed. This is a, a very interesting word, to be a sign of contradiction. And in a certain sense, when we're united with Christ, we also uh, acquired that note of contradiction in our society. People react against the name of Christ, against the Christian. And it's also not just for Christians, really. It's, you know, other religious faiths are also uh, renounced and reacted against, uh, contradicted. So there's a, a big phenomenon there uh, in the human heart that is capable of being so negative and so destructive. And therefore, the need for redemption of the human heart. <clears throat> so in all the storms of life, in the impressions we have of sinking so often and the presence of, of Jesus there with such calm. This can inspire us also that when there's tremendous opposition to our identity as believers, then we can also still be calm. We can share not just in being a point of contradiction, but also being in a point of calm. Uh, to be one of those contact points for others to not lose perspective, that there's a bigger perspective. 
that there might be just a mustard seed of the kingdom around, but we don't pull out our hair and get crazy and lose our balance. So I think this is pretty good for today, people. Let's go out and see how it is. We'll go out to the window. Yes, it's still, it's still uh, dripping consistently. Oh, somebody wanted to see this icon of Jesus the other day. This is a good moment after what we spoke about to look at it, actually. And the icons have a great uh, tradition of how they're made and what's in them and I'm not the expert of that <laughs> but here again we see this this uh, Pantocrator, this judge and it's the opening lines of John's Gospel written here in arche ehen o logos in the beginning was the word kai ho logos in proston teo, and the word was uh, in God's presence before God. Kaitheos in hologos, and the, and the word was God. He was in the beginning, hutos, and then arche proston teon, before God. Panta dia aton egenato, everything came to be through him. I horse auto again into who the in hog, and nothing came to be which exists outside of him. Nothing, uh, nothing came to be outside of him which exists. So these are the first lines of John's Gospel. Huge statement about Jesus, about his identity as the eternal Word of God through whom everything was made. You can see the, the fingers as well. Here. Three persons of the Trinity, the two natures, the union of the divine nature and the human nature. People, thank you for joining us this morning. May you have a very blessed day. No sign of the sun emerging, so we'll say goodbye here. And wish you many, many blessings. Come on, camera. There we go. So, all the best to you people. See you later, alligators. We also had groups yesterday uh, from different countries, also from Brazil, with a number of pastors and quite a few people. Uh, God bless you.